I'm an archaeologist, uh, but I didn't start out that way. In fact, I, as a kid, I was, uh, thought I was going to be an engineer, and I like to take things apart and sometimes put them back together again. Uh, but when I was growing up, I started to see parts of the world that I couldn't quite explain from an engineering perspective, uh, which tends to focus on how things work rather than why they are. I saw things uh, that were in Indian mounds, uh, mounds made by prehistoric people uh, that you find out in the woodlands of Wisconsin. Uh, and some of these mounds are really pretty spectacular. Uh, for example, this mound here is an uh, effigy mound shaped like a gigantic bird that was made by prehistoric people by their community. They got together to make this bird shape feature, uh, and, and there were some burial components to it. And it made me wonder, why would people do this? Why in this place, at this time, at that time, did they get together to build these mounds? They did, people didn't build mounds all the time, and they didn't build them everywhere. In fact, the effigy mounds are known, 99% of them are in Wisconsin. Why would you build an effigy mound in Wisconsin? It's cold. Uh, you know, why not do something else like get food? So it really made me wonder, why would they people do this? And I started to sort of see the world uh, and learn more about it, that there are a lot of places and times when people got together as a community to build really spectacular things around the world. We see this in North America, we see this in Europe, uh, we see this in South Asia. All around the world, we see these spectacular monuments. And it made me wonder, why do people build monuments? Why do they get together at certain times and places as a community uh, to construct these things? What, what's going on here? Because in some ways, they're kind of weird, they're kind of crazy. Couldn't, isn't it better to you know, focus your energy on survival, food, uh, you know, and reproduction? Uh, but people do this. So really, that's a, that seems to be an important question, because some of the things that they do are some of those spectacular cases of you know, prehistoric activity that we know of, really. Uh, achievements of humans. Um, and I thought also that if we can figure this out, if we can study the, uh, if we can understand the past, we can also understand, well, what are the conditions that are necessary that would encourage people to get together to do this? Because if we understand those conditions, we can ensure in our population, in our society, that we have those ingredients and that maybe we can get together to do things that people in the future will go, wow, that's really an impressive uh, feat. So I thought this is actually a way of looking at the, the past as a way of looking at the future. This sort of set of questions led me to, to, to leave uh, engineering, and uh, you know, uh, I sort of quickly switched majors, which uh, wasn't, didn't make my dad, who was a professor of engineering, very happy. But um, it, uh, uh, it, it led me in a very different path, and I became an archaeologist. And as an archaeologist, um, as a professor at Cal State Long Beach, I was given the opportunity to sort of study a aspects of the world that, I, that was interest to me. And I chose one place that seemed the most ridiculous of all, uh, Easter Island. It's a, a tiny little island that's also known as Rapa Nui in the local language that's in the middle of the Pacific. It's uh, 3,500 kilometers from the mainland of Chile, uh, 2,000 kilometers from any other Polynesian island. It's really a small island in the middle of nowhere, and it's tiny. It's only 24 by uh, 12 kilometers in size, a really tiny little island in the middle of the Pacific. But yet on this teeny tiny island, we find some of the most spectacular cases of prehistoric monument construction anywhere in the world. The most improbable place we have just amazing archaeology. And this archaeology is pretty famous. The statues uh, that are made there are known as moai. Uh, and these statues range from you know, a couple meters to nearly 10 meters in height. Uh, they weigh up to 70 tons of, of stone. Uh, and they're put on top of massive platforms known as ahu. So some of the most spectacular archaeology that's just amazing in this tiny, tiny place. What's going on here? Why would people do this? Well, a lot of, a lot of people know about Easter Island because of the monuments and the story that's, that's sort of grown up around that. And that's been made very famous and popular by Jared Diamond in his book, Collapse. Uh, in this book, he argues that these statues are actually responsible for the demise of the population rather than uh, an achievement of theirs that, that helped them uh, succeed. This collapse story kind of goes like this. It's, you can see it in five easy steps. Initially, there was a palm forest on the island, and we know that. We can look at the botanical remains, and we can see the evidence of a massive palm forest that once existed there. People get there, and we think they get there about the 13th century, and they start to do what people do, which is clear some land, have more people, uh, and, and do what human communities do is grow. While they're doing that, uh, they, they start, at some point, start to make moai. And moai construction on this island isn't just something that they do, uh, you know, one of, which would be amazing, uh, but they start to make more and more of them, and they get larger and larger. And there's actually a thousand statues on the island to give you a sense of how, what incredible investment of energy they're, they're focusing on this. And in some ways, you, you can sort of imagine it could be a moai mania. People want more and more moai, and they do it uh, regardless of the consequences. And it's really that sort of disregard to the environment 
uh, that sort of thought to be resulting in the destruction of the resources that are on the island, particularly the palm forest. Uh, that ecological destruction ultimately leads to people ha shortage of food, uh, that leads to warfare, and ultimately tales of cannibalism. And this is really the, the core story uh, of this collapse. And the result is, of course, societal collapse. And we can see that, uh, or Europeans saw this, when we look on the landscape, we find fallen down statues, no trees, uh, sort of the remnants of what potentially was a great society. Uh, but the Moai did it to them. And it's, it's the key sort of relationship between Moai, this Moai construction, uh, and, and this failure that, that drives this collapse story. Moai mania is, causes a downward spiral of cultural regression, in the words of the, some authors. Well, that's the, that's the mindset I had when I first went to Easter Island, when I was given the opportunity to go study there about in 2000. Um, I traveled to this island and I wanted to do field work to figure out, well, why would people do this? Why People certainly didn't get there deciding they're going to destroy their island. Uh, they got there and being successful people, uh, you know, were moved there to, to find new lands and to have families and build communities. Um, so I went to the island and I started studying the statues uh, to understand a little bit of how they were moved, what kind of size communities must have been involved with, with, with making these. Uh, but I did also work, um, did excavations to look at the earliest occupation of the island uh, with the, the goal of seeing what were people eating and how were they living when people first got there. Because obviously that wasn't, didn't have a Moai mania about it, and so I wanted to see how that changed ultimately into this path of destruction. Um, I also looked across the landscape, did survey work, and looked at where Moai are and where they're distributed on the landscape, uh, where commu how communities live, uh, where people are living, where the houses are, uh, et cetera, to sort of understand the overall society and the community uh, of, the pre of prehistory. And what I found after doing uh, 10 years of work there uh, was something that really surprised me. I had no idea this was going to be the case. Uh, and, and it still is controversial today. Uh, but fundamentally, the case is there really is no evidence whatsoever to support a prehistoric demographic collapse on Rapa Nui. That's kind of shocking because you think, well, of course there is. You know, that, that's the whole story premise of it. Everyone knows that. But in fact, there, when we look on the ground, we don't see any evidence that says that there was a w big war and that the island destroyed itself, we see uh, something quite different. We can look at things that um, people say are, are you know, aspects of warfare. Uh, we can look at the mata'a, which are obsidian tools that we find by the thousands across the island. And these are often said to be these weapons of mass destruction that were involved with the warfare, where people use these to kill each other. When we look at these in detail, we find not what we would expect to see in lethal weapons, which are pointy things that we would use to stab people, uh, or, people, or things that are effective at killing people, we f instead find sort of really irregular devices that wouldn't do much in the way of stabbing anything. And we find use wear on it, patterns of how those things interacted with the ground, that's consistent with cultivation. So rather than being weapons of mass destruction, uh, what we're really seeing is the remnants of people cultivating uh, plants and using the landscape. So the opposite of what, of what, of what the story's often told. One of the things that's going on here is that I think some of, the, some of this prehistoric collapse idea comes from a confusion about what happened after Europeans get there. And what we see is potential, what we know, we have good documentation of, is that in the 18th century, uh, European contact resulted in, in catastrophic demographic loss. And it's really well documented. We have lots of historic records uh, that point to the fact that Rapa Nui people interact with the Europeans that arrived and that they got, the disease was passed from the Europeans on, onto the Rapa Nui, and the Rapa Nui people uh, uh, died in, in large numbers. Uh, really catastrophic history. Um, that happened many places in many islands in many parts of the world uh, due to the differences in sort of the histories of Europeans and, and uh, Polynesian people. We can look at the, the historic records to see really directly the, the impact of this. In 1722, Jacob Rogovine, who was a Dutch captain, or was the first European to arrive on the island. And when he gets there, he sees 3,000 people. He estimates somewhere about 3,000 people on the island. And he describes them as healthy and robust. They're doing really well. And they're about 3,000 or so. Um, after that, uh, we start to see smaller and smaller numbers. The uh, Spanish captain Gonzalez uh, sees about 2,000. Cook sees even fewer. Uh, and the numbers over the next uh, century or so uh, get smaller and smaller and smaller until 1877, uh, when there are just 111 Rapa Nui people alive on the island. That the population goes from 3,000 and healthy to 111 that are riddled with disease uh, and really struggling for survival. And really, all the, the people living on the island today uh, are all descended from these 111 people. Uh, we have good records of that. So we know that happened. And we can also see the effect that this disease had on the landscape. Uh, and that often is confused as being somehow connected to this prehistoric collapse. 
Uh, a lot of times, people would say, well, of course there's a collapse, a prehistoric collapse. We can look on the landscape, and the statues are all falling down. And these statues were falling down because people were fighting each other and knocking each other's statues down. And that's in oral traditions, and we know that. So that's the, the, of course there's a collapse. Well, when we, look at the, when we look at carefully at the historic record, we see a very different story. Jacob Rogovin, uh, when, he, when he was there he, uh, in 1722, he doesn't describe a single toppled statue, but instead he describes the statues all standing up. And in fact, he, there are drawings that he made in early European explorers uh, of standing statues, and they describe how tall they are, and they measure them. Uh, so initially, we don't see any toppled statues. Gonzales, also uh, 50 years later, doesn't see any toppled statues at all. He describes all the statues as standing. Um, in Cook, though, on the other hand, starts to see toppled down statues. He starts to describe the fact that some statues are standing and the other ones are laying on the ground broken. And in fact, he sees skeletons and other kinds of things that look like destruction. And so a lot of our ideas about uh, this collapse come from his observations. But over time, we see fewer and fewer uh, standing statues and more and more statues that have fallen down uh, and, and uh, are on the landscape. Uh, and in fact, by 1868, the British notice uh, that there's not a single standing statue. Any statue that you see today uh, was stood back up uh, after 1950. So, so after 1968, there wasn't a single statue. So all of the evidence that, we, that people talk about as being fallen statues that are, is therefore uh, uh, evidence of warfare and this collapse is simply the result of populations, uh, uh, population loss due to disease and changes in the economics that people are no longer investing in statues. Uh, so it's, an e it's a European event, a historic event, not something prehistoric. We also see when we look at the survey work that there probably was never a very large population. A lot of the assumptions about collapse is that Rogovin saw 3,000 people. And Europeans say, well, there must have been a lot more people. Look at all these statues. There's nearly 1,000. It must have been maybe 10,000 or 20,000 people. So when Rogovin sees 3,000, clearly the population had already declined. And what we're seeing is the remnants of what a much greater population. Well, great. OK, but when we look at the archaeological record, we really don't see that evidence. Um, Take the, the south coast of the island, for example, We're doing some uh, survey work. What we, when we look, focus on the south coast, uh, what we don't see are large evidence of large villages where people are densely living, with the landscape around it being intensely used for cultivation to support that large population. Instead, what we see is a, is a low density distribution of, of, of material and features and household debris uh, that represents a, a population of society living across the landscape in a low density way. Relatively small numbers of houses uh, distributed across the island as people are using the landscape in a, an extensive way rather than very intensively. So the archaeological record just simply doesn't point to the kinds of evidence that would support a large population. We see something very, very different. We also now know that the environment of Rapa Nui uh, was never particularly great, uh, that the, the soils themselves are actually very depleted, have uh, very low nutrients, uh, sort of naturally, because it, they're very weathered soils. So the result was that the, the resources that people needed to survive on uh, were never that particularly fantastic. Uh, people had to, to live in a very ingenious way. And what they did, which is pretty amazing, uh, was enrich the soil by using lithic, uh, lithic mulch gardening. And lithic mulch gardening consists of taking pieces of uh, fresh bedrock, breaking them up into pieces, and laying it on the, t on the surface of the ground and in the ground in order to expose the soil to new, so to new nutrients, to new minerals. And that allowed the, the soils to have enough productivity, just enough productivity, to reliably grow sweet potato, which is the primary crop of Easter Island. So what we said, instead of uh, a rich environment that gets destroyed, instead we see people taking a uh, once treed environment and turning it into a, a garden landscape that allowed them to grow resources that, that enabled them to survive. And we look across the, the island, and we look at rock mulch or the slithic mulch uh, across the island. We see it scattered sort of extensively, similar to what we saw with the community evidence, uh, scattered extensively across the island uh, in a sort of low density capacity. And it provided food in a reliable way uh, that, that enabled people to, to live there. We also know that evidence now that statues didn't require armies of people. Certainly some of the older ideas about um, statue movement, uh, which led to the idea there must have been a collapse, is the idea that there must have been armies of people and armies of other people to support those armies of people moving the statues. Because they're so heavy, how else could you do it but have a thousand people dragging this around? When we look at the details of the statues themselves, when we look carefully at the evidence that exists, we can see that there's systematic differences between statues once they get to the ahu, the platform, from the statues that are found along the way that were on the way from the quarries to the ahu, that these statues, we call them road moai, uh, are quite different. And they're different in a very particular kind of way. Uh, they're leaning forward. They're, they're uh, in fact, tipping over. They don't even stand up on their own. 
Uh, once they get to the platform, the ahu, in fact, the, ch the statues are, are changed or modified by prehistoric people to make them stand up. But in the roadways, we find all the statues, every single one of them, leaning really far forward. And they have a very peculiar base. The base is very rounded on the front edge. And we think that what's going on here is that the statues were moved like gigantic refrigerators, but even more so, they were designed in such a way that they could be moved by small numbers of people in its, this standing up position. Uh, and all of the evidence that we find in terms of how they're fallen, how they're broken, how they're constructed, how they fail, all points to the fact that they were standing up uh, and that they fell down, some of them fell down during transport, uh, but many of them made it to uh, the Ahu and, and were changed uh, once they got there. Now you might say, well, that's a great you know, academic story, uh, you know, sort of maybe it's possible, maybe it's not, uh, you know, but we, we wanted to say, go p beyond that, um, and we, so we made one. Well, we made a statue, a five-ton version of this statue, and we demonstrated that, in fact, 12 people could move a five-ton statue. In fact, we were able to move this statue 100 meters in about 40 minutes, which suggests that we could move a statue like this uh, about a kilometer in a day. So what seemed to be something that was this inhuman effort that took incredible amounts of energy and resources and people was actually a, ingeniously designed uh, a statues that were designed to take steps and walk themselves down the roadways. It's pretty incredible. The, the statues literally go from immovable. These statues go from immovable objects, I mean, they're incredibly heavy, to something that's literally dancing down the road. I mean, it's really <laughs> mind-blowing, and it really opened my eyes to how incredibly ingenious these people were. Uh, so what, instead of a record of, of failure and terribleness that people, did, you know, that people inflicted upon themselves, what we see is success. We see the success of Rapa Nui. And rather than see this as tales of things that we should avoid in the future, we, we see uh, a tale of 500 years of persistence of people on a remote and tiny island in the middle of the Pacific with very limited resources. We see people who are making smart choices that enable them to persist. And not everybody in all the Pacific actually made it from initial colonization to European contact. Rapa Nui is, is sort of uniquely uh, remote and isolated and has the record of survival. So from that, I, th I think rather than seeing Rapa Nui as a case that we need to avoid and let's not do what they did, uh, we actually need to learn from them. And there's a number of lessons we can draw uh, for ourselves about the, the prehistory of Rapa Nui. Uh, first uh, is the fact that cooperation matters. Cooperation on a tiny remote island uh, is necessary. And we can see on, on, on Rapa Nui that, um, that cooperation was inherent in the society because statues and moai, the moai and the ahu, uh, needed groups of people to make. You can't move it on your own. You need your neighbor. And the fact that there's nearly 1,000 statues and uh, you know, over 100 ahu clearly indicates the importance of these people getting together to move these statues. The cooperation is probably the key to the success of them, and the, make, and the construction of these uh, uh, moai and the transport of them probably was uh, uh, activity that, were, that ultimately were helped the community rather than uh, caused some failure. They did it in a smart way, uh, small groups of people getting together to cooperate, and the sharing of the resource and the effort probably was, was something that really was key in surviving on this tiny island. We can also see that diversity and innovation are something we should really value. The Rapa Nui people uh, certainly uh, uh, brought statue construction with them, as, as other Polynesians brought statue and monument construction with them on other islands. But on Rapa Nui, statue construction became incredibly important. Uh, it happened to be to provide the right mechanisms, the right ingredients that enabled the society to be stable and persist over 500, 500 years. For ourselves, we need to think about the fact that you wouldn't have guessed that statue construction would have been so important on Easter Island. Uh, it was one of the many things that they were doing, uh, and, and it just happened to be the right thing. Now, there's probably in ourselves, uh, in our own society, many things that we're doing today that we don't know uh, are going to be critical uh, for our success in the future. So, since we don't know exactly what's the recipe for the future, we need to always encourage diversity and innovation whenever possible. Because some of those things that we do, that we may think are crazy at any point in time, may be the things that help us survive uh, going forward. Uh, lastly, we, we can see that the Rapa Nui people, by virtue of being on this island uh, that's so remote, uh, had to think local, local, local in everything that they did. They were forced to. They couldn't go off to some other island when they ran out of food. 
uh, and, and pop over to get some stuff. They had to live on the island and survive every kind of environment that, that, that it, it experienced. Uh, and they did so by structuring their society and their cultivation uh, and their organization such that they could survive using what they had available uh, that was locally available, uh, and that allowed them to persist. They, didn't, they weren't subject to external events happening or trade connections failing. Uh, they, they had everything they needed and, and by, by virtue of having to be there, um, and they survived. Uh, in the same way, I think in our, we need to think about that ourselves. We often, it's easier to sometimes rely on long-distance things uh, that give us uh, immediate success, but probably put us in more peril going, uh, in the long run uh, because we start to add on more risk because we're dependent upon more, di more uh, distant kinds of resources. So in the end, uh, my interest in archaeology kind of led back to engineering. And as I started to figure out how these monuments and how this society work, sort of got me back to engineering. And from this evidence, we can see the statue construction, while it might seem like a peculiar and curious thing and kind of crazy, is in fact likely the, the, the key to their success. That the, the secret to how they did this uh, is embedded in the things that we think are crazy but are perfectly sensible to the people that were there. And we have the evidence to demonstrate that as they persisted for 500 years on this tiny island. So I think there's a lot to be learned from the past. We often think about the past as some idiosyncratic story that happened in the past and who cares. But in fact, all the lessons about how change occurs and what's necessary for long-term persistence exist in the past and we have much, much to learn about that. Thank you. <laughs>